the Cape Elizabeth Planning Board for Tuesday, March 16, 2010. Uh, we have uh, five members present, which is a quorum, so we'll get started. First item we, we have on our agenda is the minutes for the previous meetings. Does anybody have any questions, comments, thoughts, or suggestions on the minutes? Present a motion. Certainly. I move that we accept the minutes as presented. Second. Motion having been made by Beth Richardson and seconded by Jim Hubner. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion? Motion carries 5 nothing. the minutes are approved. Next item we have on our agenda is the consent agenda item, agenda item for Eastman Meadows Subdivision Resource Protection Permit. Uh, Wiley Enterprises is looking for an extension on the resource protection permit. Uh, any questions, comments, thoughts, or suggestions on the uh, request? Hearing none, a motion? Yeah. Um, I'd like to offer a motion to the board for consideration, be it ordered that based on the request, the previously approved plans and materials and the facts presented, the request of Wiley Enterprises LLC for a one-year extension of the resource protection permit for Eastman Meadows, a 46-unit condominium project located at 68 Eastman Road, be approved. Second. Thank you. Dr. Lane? Yes. A motion having been made by uh, Beth Richardson and seconded by Elaine Fallander. All, uh, any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion. Motion carries 5 nothing. We are rolling. <laughs> the next item on our agenda is Rudy's of the Cape Restaurant Site Plan. Two Lights General Store LLC is requesting site plan review for an 80-seat restaurant and convenience store located at the existing Rudy's establishment at 517 Ocean House Road under Section 19-9 Site Plan Public Hearing. Uh, if I could have the applicants or their representatives step up to the microphone, introduce themselves, and present the project, the board will consider it. Um, my name is Patrick Carroll. I'm with Carroll Associates in Portland, and I'm here tonight representing Mary Page at Rudy's. Um, I think, and I talked to Maureen a little bit about this, I think rather than kind of backing up and going through a full presentation, I think I'd like to just kind of touch on changes that have been made since the last time we presented to the board. That would be most welcome. Okay, good. Um, plans that were submitted in, I think it was the 1st of March, um, we're actually very close to, um, if I can perhaps zoom in here a little bit, uh, pretty close to kind of what was originally submitted back in February, uh, with the exception being that we've kind of just cleaned up some, some details based on um, uh, some comments from the town engineer and um, and we made some changes based on the site walk that we had on February 28th. Uh, the biggest change from the site walk has been that uh, that the sidewalk, which runs along Route 77 here, uh, originally kind of came up and followed the property line, which jogged up like this, and and so the the sidewalk kind of typically you would follow the the, uh, the right of way. So that's what we had done. There was a request by one of the neighbors to try to straighten that out. And we have done that. So that's that was the major change from the uh, from the site walk. Um, we did add wheel stops at at each of the parking spaces uh, to delineate the parking because it is a gravel lot. Uh, we did add some signage. There was some discussion about where uh, trucks with trailers, construction contractors that pull in with a trailer, which typically now just kind of pull in and park in here, uh, where they would park in this scheme. And so we've actually added some signage back here, here because we, we feel like there's, there's room here for a couple of trucks with trailers to park in here. And there's also some room along this side. This is where the service trucks will come in and service the building with food and ice and so forth. Um, so we did add some signage to the plan that indicates that those are spaces that are where contractors or trucks with trailers would uh, would be allowed to park. And the reason we feel like like it's acceptable here is because this is actually a 24 foot wide aisle, but we really only have one way circulation through here. So we've really got an additional 12 feet of, of width along this edge where where it's going to be very easy for a for a vehicle to kind of move around those cars as they're parked there. 
Uh, there was a request from the town engineer to add site distances to, at the exit, and we have added site distances, I believe, in, in the southerly direction, it's about 450 feet, and in the northerly direction, it's, a, it's approximately 650 feet. So we've got plenty of good site distance. Uh, that wasn't an issue, it was just the town engineer wanted that um, noted on the plans. Um, some other minor modifications that occurred. We added some details. There was a detail that was lacking for the what, how we're dealing with the gravel pad underneath the propane tank and a concrete pad underneath the, uh, the dumpster area. Those have been added to the plans. Um, and uh, he has asked in his latest memo for, for a couple of minor other details, such as what the wheel stop material is. And um, there were several other minor kind of uh, revisions that he had asked for, one being a 10-foot uh, a foot deep paved kind of apron at the entrance and exit, which all of which in his comments were, were more than willing to accommodate. So, so that's not an issue. Um, there was some discussion about, uh, uh, we've, we've had recent discussion with CMP about uh, electrical service currently. Electrical service comes in an overhead line and there's a pole here and then it kind of goes into the building. Uh, we did meet with them on site last Friday and initially we'd been talking about maybe stopping that pole or terminating that pole back here somewhere at the property line and then dropping down and going underground. And uh, he indicated that it was fine to kind of continue overhead. So we'll, we're going to shorten that pole up to the property line and then feed just that we're going to keep a pole mounted transformer at that location and then just bring the electric service right into the building, the same location that it currently exists. Um, there were some modifications to the floor plans. The floor plans, if I can kind of back out of here. Floor plans, we had some, some typos in them, basically. But the way the seating is going to work, and there's a, there's a summer plan and a winter plan, uh, there's a total of 80 seats that, that we're proposing. Um, in the summer scheme, 28 of those seats would be, well, in, in both schemes, 28 of them are movable tables and chairs. And so in the summertime, those 28 tables and 28 seats and uh, tables would be moved out to the patio. Uh, there's fixed seating inside. This is 24 seats in a booth situation. There's 20 seats in this counter here and another eight seats that are fixed seating over here. So in the summertime, you know, this will all be kind of open space through here. Uh, 28 seats out on the outdoor patio area, 52 seats inside. In the winter scheme, those 28 movable seats would come in and they'd be, there'd be uh, 20 of those that would be located in the, in the left-hand side dining area and another eight that would be located in the, uh, the right-hand side kind of grill area. So those 28 seats would be moved inside and, and located. The 52 fixed seats would remain the same. So that's how we're dealing with it and um, there's, no, there's no desire to to extend beyond 80 seats or to have, you know, 28 seats outside and, and 70 seats inside. That's, that's really not the, the intent that Mary's after. It's a total of 80 seats. Um, Pat, can I ask you a question? Sure. We've had at least one letter, if not more than one, that made reference to there being some uh, uh, intention to have many more than 80 seats and that you were counting wrong, we were counting wrong. Do you have any sense or, or no? I think what, the, what that that, that was a, that was about. There were some early floor plans that were submitted by the architect, mm -hmm. and um, there were some they were misnumbered as far as the number of seats, and uh, there was a miscommunication on our part as as to kind of how he needed to kind of arrange those. So we kind of got that all cleared up, and and this is you know. I mean, logically, it makes sense that you'd have, you have fixed seats that are going to remain summer and winter, and the movable seats will, will move outside in the summertime and inside in the wintertime. And 
it may be, you know, it may be that there are only 20 seats that move outside and, and the other eight seats remain inside, but there'll be a total of 80. Uh, there's no commitment to, I mean, there's no desire to expand beyond that. Beyond that, okay. I know there was, there was also some discussion very early on about an upstairs Our and the potential for meeting space up there, and uh, that's all been. It's no longer an issue. no longer an issue. While we're on seating, can I clarify one other thing? Uh, first of all, the plans you're discussing are not the plans we have in front of us. Is that correct? Uh, that, that's, that's not correct. They are the plans you have in front of you. Because the plans I have in front of me have seating errors and I'm not seeing up there. Is that the March 1st plan? I don't uh, think the math on mine doesn't add up on it. No. There were, there were plans that I submitted to Maureen, uh, <clears throat> I think it was last week, that you said you were going to kind of distribute to the... Because the plans that we have contain seating errors that I don't think are... that I think most of which I think have been corrected, but I'm not... Yeah, sure. I, think, I think what it is, the, the plans that were submitted on March 1st had those seating errors in it. Okay. And... Um, the architect was out of town, and we couldn't get those changes made until after we had submitted. Well, I submitted last week, and I, Maureen has copies of those okay, um, okay. in her office. But you don't get and it. It's, and it's these plans right here. So we have made them correct. One other seating issue that's been raised, and I'd appreciate clarifying it with Maureen just so the public can hear it before we get to the presentation, is the status of the uh, couch and lounge chair here not to be included in any of the seating calculations. The question has been raised as to, you know, whether the couch and lounge chair need to be included, and I'd appreciate hearing from Maureen if there's any precedent for that. And Okay, because it's still not included in your calculations as I'm hearing you. Right, it's not included because I guess the the concept is that there would be no, no dining at those at those locations. People waiting for a meal could they get would they get drinks and appetizers in those seats if they were waiting to sit at a table? People may be waiting there, and they may potentially, I guess, they could yes, but uh, they're not considered dining seats by any means. But we have no specific precedent that you can point to on that question. Okay, thank you. We were, where is that shown on the plan? Or it says non-dining. It, right it just says non-dining. It's right there. Oh, on I the right-hand side, <clears throat> there's a small little fireplace area there. Okay, so it's uh, not called out as seats. No. That's, that's, no. Meaning service seats. No, they're not service seats. It's not the entire. So those are the major changes. And I guess, um, let me back up here and, and get to a, a site plan here. Um, okay. There have been, there have been several kind of letters and emails and memos going around and, and I sat down today and I've, I've got a whole folder full of them and tried to kind of just categorize kind of really what, what the real issues are that, uh, that people, staff and neighbors have brought up. And it really boils down to, I think, uh, four issues. And so I'd like to just kind of go through those very quickly and just try to dispel any, any, uh, any of these things before they kind of rear their heads. Um, first is parking. And the, um, I know there's been some discussion about what happens in case of overflow parking. And we recognize that there really are, are 25 spaces here. The 25 spaces do meet the ordinance. Um, but you know we're as concerned as everybody about about what would happen if there was an event or a group of people that came and and had no place to park. Uh, we're aware of kind of the, the nature of uh, Davis Point Road as a private right of way. We're aware of the private parking associated with the Two Lights uh, Professional Center. Um, we're also aware of kind of the issue of parking on uh, Route 77. So, in, in, in an effort to try to uh, deal with that issue, um, we've done two things. One is 
Um, we've taken a look at how much parking could we conceivably fit on site um, if, we, if we had to. And the answer is we can probably fit about uh, 34 cars on site. Uh, again, utilizing the area that we had discussed about for trailer parking here and uh, service parking over here. So we think we can fit potentially another seven or eight cars on site if necessary without interfering with, um, with the safety or circulation. Mary Page is also kind of, and I think it's part of your, in part of your packet, um, approached uh, Father Henschel at St. Bart's, and uh, as you know, St. Bart's worked out a, an agreement with him by the sea for um, overflow parking associated with their operation. And he has submitted a letter, which you have, that indicates that he's more than willing to kind of accommodate overflow parking at, at St. Bart's in the same manner. So. We don't have a legal document yet. I think the, the idea is that once, uh, once we get through the approvals, um, the, the lawyers will get together and draft a, a legal agreement that will be kind of submitted back to the board, I assume, as a condition of approval. So we think that uh, given that, um, you know, the, the ability to accommodate some small number of overflow parking on site and larger numbers uh, off-site at, at St. Bart's, uh, we've, we think we've accommodated the overflow parking issue. The one issue that remains with that is, and I have, I've had calls into Bob Malley to discuss this, I haven't been able to get a hold of him, the ability to, to uh, provide a crosswalk on route, across Route 77 for those, for those uh, drivers or passengers that are they're having to park at St. Bart's and walk over to Rudy's. Um, and um, I know Mary's been after the town for quite a few years to, to actually have a crosswalk installed there. So maybe this is an opportune time to kind of get that in place. And um, whether it's something the town does or, or Mary ends up doing, I think it's, it's a small, small ticket item. It's not a very just, expensive. Just so I have it clear on the record, the, the applicant is willing to do it if the town gives yes. green light. Yes. Okay. Um, second issue that, that has been kind of discussed in several emails and uh, letters is, is one of noise. And I just want to kind of just briefly kind of uh, give our pitch here on how we're dealing with that. Uh, first of all, it's, it's, a, it's a limited season that, that the outdoor dining is going to be in operation. You know, we're really talking about, you know, maybe three months total out of, out of the year. It's also a very limited number of seats. We're talking about a maximum of 28 seats outside. Um, it is fenced. It is located on the south side of the building. And I took some measurements today. That outdoor dining area is actually 280 feet uh, from the neighbor on, on the other side of Davis Point Road. And it's 180 feet to the closest house across Route 77. And in fact, directly across Route 77 is, is really the green space that's in front of the, the Catholic Church. So um, we think it's, it's quite a ways away from any, it's not like it's abutting right next door to a, to a neighbor. Um, the building and the fencing will actually do quite a bit to kind of mitigate any kind of noise. Um, there, is a, uh, there is a noise ordinance in effect in the, in the town of Cape Elizabeth that uh, we would have to meet. And it really becomes, as much as anything, a, a, an enforcement issue. Uh, we are not planning any amplified live music. Um, I think that there may be some speakers out there with some small, you know, some some low kind of uh, music that would be kind of piped in from inside. Probably be the same music that would be inside the uh, the restaurant. There may be an acoustic guitar on occasion. There may be, Mary has talked about perhaps having a jazz combo from the high school come down on a Sunday afternoon and maybe play for an hour or so. So it's, it's something of that nature. It's not like we're going to bring kind of guns and roses in here for a, for a big concert or anything. Um, we are not applying for an entertainment license at this point in time. Um, because entertainment is really not what this, this is about. This place is really about dining and gathering 
um, with neighbors and friends. Third issue that, that has come up is the landscape buffering, and it's primarily this buffering that, that occurs on the uh, north side of the property line adjacent to uh, Davis Point Road and wrapping around this corner here. And as you know, we've pulled all the parking back. This is, this is about, well, it's actually 102 feet um, to the, from, the, from the zone boundary, which is the other side of Davis Point Road, to any parking or any development or any activity that would, that would occur uh, associated with the restaurant here. Um, so we've got a green space in here. This will be lawn. And as I indicated at the site walk, uh, we've got a series of mixed vegetation. This is, there, there are evergreen trees. I think there are nine evergreen trees. There are four deciduous trees and I think 37 flowering shrubs that would be massed up in there. Um, there is about a two to three foot berm that, that runs kind of parallel with Davis Point Road to give some additional height and buffering. And our feeling is that's, that's really quite adequate for, for the small amount of uh, activity that, that would be occurring on this side of the building. Again, you know, most of the activity, most of the parking, um, and uh, you know, restaurant patrons coming and going is really going to be from the south side here. So we we feel pretty strongly that, that we've we've really kind of dressed this area up. We've actually planted, I think, three times more trees than what uh, uh, Mr. Ingalls did along here. And I think with the addition of the fencing that's been installed, the trees, the existing trees that are in place, and these new trees, I think it, it provides in my opinion, adequate uh, buffering for this use. Fourth item here is uh, schedule. And it's Mary's intent that um, actually upon approval, she's going to start uh, as soon as possible this spring it, with some of the site work. And uh, the idea is that uh, the intent would be to complete the driveway, the parking, the landscaping, um, all this spring. And, um, and that the building renovation and expansion and perhaps even and probably the, the outdoor dining in that location would occur in some subsequent phase, probably in the fall or, or next year. So the intent is really to kind of get the site work, the heavy work done this spring uh, so she can, they can use that parking this summer. Um, that the buffering will be in place so that the uh, impact on the neighbors will be minimized. And um, at that point, I think um, she, she'd like to have the, uh, the extra hour added in, um, utilizing the existing, existing building and the, the, the seating that's, that's in the building now. So we're not asking to jam 80 seats inside that existing building, but uh, uh, we are asking for for the uh, ability to stay open until um, 10 o'clock prior to completing the whole building renovation, which is a, a, a major kind of undertaking at this point. So with that proposed schedule, just so I'm clear, that would not include the outside service at this? The outside dining? Right. It may, if it does, it would be in the back, kind of where the building addition is now. It would be, it would be back here, but it would be a temporary outdoor dining area until the building renovation and expansion occurs. Uh, we haven't gotten that far, but I, I know when she talked to me, she said that her major priorities were the driveway, the parking, the landscaping, and getting all that in place. So uh, what would the total seating count contemplated then be if you used a temporary outdoor space? I don't know. I mean, you know, it would be a matter of kind of whatever whatever's in there now, I think. I think she now has approval for 39 seats. So are you asking for approval of additional seats before the building addition is completed? No. Or no inclu just, so including indoor and outdoor seating, it would still only be the existing 39 seats? I think so, yeah. Is that what you're asking for? I haven't really talked to Mary about that, but... 
Well, I'm trying, I'm trying to pin down what the applicant is looking for in terms of, for lack of a better word, phasing here because it's not. Well, I guess the phasing is that, that the building really is not going to go in this spring or summer. Okay. And so because of that, I think there was, there was, a, there was an email that, that went around, I think it was from Bruce Smith, that said that all the improvements had to be in place prior to, to getting the additional seating or the additional hour of use. And I guess what I'm saying is that, you know, she's going to be doing the major improvements and the improvements that are really going to help mitigate this activity from the neighbors this spring. But the major improvements as far as the building go are not going to happen right away. I understand what you're saying. My, one of my concerns is I don't know to what degree we have that authority, given that this is site plan review. So I'm, I don't disagree with your theory. Fix up the outside, mitigate you know the existing parking, improve the landscaping, you know, uh, and you're not expanding out anywhere. But my only concern is you have an existing use that's essentially grandfathered. You have a new site plan approval, mm -hmm. um, and I don't know whether we can stepwise that. I'm not saying we can't, but why don't we finish the full presentation? Yeah, okay. I still have a public hearing to get through, so everybody's... I know, I agree. I'm just about done. No, that's fine. And I have a few more questions. The board may have some questions of the applicant before we get to the public. But go ahead, Pat. Okay. And I guess... Actually, I am done. Except I had one other kind of uh, question, actually more than an issue, and that is um, I know there's been some discussion about a performance guarantee and... Uh, I'm assuming that the performance guarantee would actually only be tied to any kind of public improvements anyway. It's not going to be tied to the building. No, that's... But I just wanted to clarify that. I, I, want, I was going to make that point on... But... Good question? Yeah. I'm concerned with the word public. Well, or... Well, usually, usually a performance guarantee has to do with... Um, Utilities, everything, everything outside the building. Everything outside, yeah. Landscaping, so that you're kind You're putting of lights on the building, those would right. count, but it's... Everything outside of the but building. The building itself. itself. I mean, she doesn't have to pro post a performance guarantee for the building. No. Okay. All set. I'm all set. I, I have one quick question. It was the area that it was the lighting. Can you just address that? There was uh, you had sent us an email, but I want it on the record. Um, yes, there was. Um, let me back out of this for a second here. And this is probably impossible to read. You should be able to slide it and blow it up. Um, there was Maureen, in her kind of um, wisdom, kind of picked up on a point there these are these are actually if you if you're familiar with this or not these are actually foot candles of light throughout the property and the ordinance says that at the property line you can't have more than a half a foot candle of light spilling over the property line the lighting manufacturer that prepared this for us incorrectly drew the property line here but actually calculated the property line foot candles out here. Um, and Maureen kind of which saw is, this point here. And which, is, which is where the property line is. Which is where the property line really is. It's, it's right on the, the outside of, uh, the inside of where the sidewalk is, which is right here. The small letters, the numbers here, are actually the property line numbers. And inside is kind of within the property. But she picked up on this and said, well, we have a slight issue here. Um, you're spilling, you've got 0.6 and it's supposed to be 0.5. And I went back to the manufacturer and was talking to her about it. And she goes, oh, well, wait a minute. It, the property line's really out here. So you can see we're actually meeting the ordinance at the property line. Um, we did have an earlier issue in the, in the previous submission with lighting. And, um, and there were two pole lights. There's one out here. And there's another one on the other side, one at the entrance and one at the, the exit, um, that actually were spilling over it. I think it was eight tenths or seven tenths of a foot candle at the property line. Initially, we didn't feel like that was, should have been an issue because you'd like to have more light kind of at, a, at an entrance and an exit point for visibility. But in order to meet the ordinance requirement, we went back to the lighting manufacturer 
and they've now specified in this plan here to put hoods on on these two lights uh, which drops the foot candles down you can see we're down at point one over here and point oh two point two over here so so the lighting should uh, should be fine it doesn't spill it's it's very minimal at the property line if if any at all so I think we're in good shape there. and as you're driving along 77 you want the hoods should shield the bolts true the hoods will shield the but these are all kind of um, um, state-of-the-art kind of lighting and uh, you, you shouldn't see any of the light sources themselves the light sources are all tucked up inside it's not like the old shoebox fixture with where, where you'd see the lamp kind of hanging down below it they're all tucked up inside it's really indirect light that kind of drives drops down and um, it's very well controlled they've they've got ways now to kind of engineer these lenses and so forth such that they can they can be very accurate on the placement of light you all set now? I'm all set. Any other questions? Sure, does the board have any questions of the applicant before we move on to the public? Go ahead. Um, in regards to the relocated sign for Rudy's, that's not lit, correct? Uh, there are signs, there are lights on it now. Is it indicated up there with the wattage or the uh, I don't, you know, it, sign? We, no, because these were actually, what they did their foot candles on was based on um, on uh, the new lighting, and there are two small little kind of incandescent lights that kind of light the sign now. Um, Any idea what the foot candle is on that? I can't believe that it's, it's in order to, to exceed the, the uh, ordinance, it would have to be four tenths of a foot candle at the property line. I, they're, they're very small incandescent lights. I can't believe they're, they're going to do that, but we could have that studied and report back if that's yeah I think that's something we might need any other questions um, not on the light no. Okay. no it's we're wide open for the board before we take public comments for the applicant anyone else I'm not sure how practical it is parking at st. Bart's um, I don't know I'm just thinking out loud I know in by the sea buses people back and forth I think but I was because it's farther I mean, I get it. It's a place to go. Have you talked to Ingalls about the building behind? Can you have overflow parking there, or is that a no-go? I think we had some initial discussions with Ingalls about that, and um, at the time, it's probably still a fact. I mean, he's, he was trying to sell it, yeah. and I think he just didn't really want to kind of burden the property with that at that point in time. Okay. Um, the other issue with with parking in that parking lot would be that access would have to come off of Davis Point Road and so we've kind of tried to stay away from yep. there just to try and understand the concerns of the neighbors. I can hear your concern because there's, there's no sidewalk. They'd have to walk through the grass or on the road and broad There's cold. snow in the road. No, but I mean there is overflow parking that occurs at St. Bart's now like on you know Christmas or Easter and they end up parking in the street. And, and, uh, that is true. They park up and down Broad Cove. Yeah. Uh, that's the, yeah. When on Christmas and Easter masses. Yeah. Do they? Um, there is there is called out on the plan a short sidewalk between the two lights in your parking. Correct. There is, there is, and that's as much as anything. It's just for the convenience of uh, of you know the residents and, and people that are ultimately going to be living and working in that building. Where you said there's a sidewalk? If, yeah, if you look at... Uh, yeah, we show just a small sidewalk connector between the two. To the Two Lights Professional Center. Right. Yeah, to not the, going uh, towards... Oh, the, oh, yeah, not that. I thought you meant the St. Bart's. Yeah, no, 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 St. Bart's. Yeah. Oh. Got all excited. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Is parking legal on Broad Cove Road? I believe Maureen had a comment from, from the police chief. I think it's... It's legal up until no bike lane. Up until no kind of, I think you have there's like 50 feet or 40 feet from the from the stop sign you can't park. Go ahead, Maureen. Yeah, we I explored that with the police chief, and I think I copied the planning board on those memos. And um, you can park on both sides of Broad Cove Road. You can park on Route 70. You can't park on the tarred surface of Route 77, but you can park on the grass off of the tarred surface of Route 77. Even though there's a bike lane? 
because you wouldn't be on the bike lane, you'd be on the grass. On the grass. Beyond the, I, I see, okay. But beyond, beyond the, essentially the breakdown lane. But there's an expectation that people wouldn't be doing that as much in front of this property because the area, the grassed area is steeply sloped to accommodate the drainage from Route 77, whereas it's not as steeply sloped in front of um, the good table where you see more of that happen. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're not convinced it's going to be a big issue. I mean, we think that, uh, you know, the 25 parking spaces should, for 95% of the time. Uh, well, the feedback we got from neighbors, and I do want to open it up at this point, was that there's been more, more than 30 cows counted at some of the peak hours with less seats. So um, I, I could see that could be an issue. But if the board is all set question the applicant like we, we can still ask some questions later but why don't we open the uh, public hearing and invite anyone up to the podium to make comments if you could do two things uh, just identify yourself um, and you can make your comments and one other thing I would ask is if you have some submitted something in writing if you just let us know when you're at the podium because uh, frequently it's good to follow along with uh, some of the written comments when you're up there and maybe we have questions over uh, good evening. My name is Morris Kreitz. I live at 524, 524 Ocean House Road across the street from Rudy's. First, first of all, I'd like to commend Rudy, Rudy's owner, Mary Page, and Pat Carroll. I think that the site plan that they're submitting um, is thoughtful and if the project is built as it's, as it's shown on that plan, um, it, it's going to make Rudy's a much more attractive property than it is now. Um, the recently adopted neighborhood business zone allows for a <coughs> restaurant bar um, to provide food, drink, and even live entertainment outdoors until 10 p.m seven nights a week in close proximity to adjacent houses. In my opinion, this is not compatible with our neighborhood. However, my, my opinion apparently is not the prevailing view in town. When you do approve Rudy's plans, as I expect you will, please make it clear that the buffer planting must be installed as shown on the plan, and in accordance with section 19.8.1 of your zoning ordinance, uh, and that this be in place before Rudy's is allowed to occupy any outdoor seating area. I might just add that I was a little distressed to hear that they're looking to do this in phases and, and looking for some intermediate temporary um, outside dining area that we hadn't heard about before this evening. In addition, um, if we are supposed to be able to rely upon section 19.9.5 paragraph O of the zoning ordinance, which regards noise, if we're, if we're supposed to be able to rely on that ordinance to protect us from excessive noise, there must be some enforcement mechanism in place. I urge the town to establish some means by which noise complaints, which are most likely to occur at night, can be dealt with promptly and effectively. Um, I worry about the fact that the code enforcement officer isn't going to be much interested in going out on Saturday night. Uh, he doesn't live in Cape anyway. Um, I, we need a better way to enforce that if it does become a problem. Um, in, in conclusion, I like to insist that the town is, does not continue to be reluctant to enforce the existing zoning regulations. These regulations are meant to ensure that a business like Rudy's can, in fact, coexist peacefully with its surrounding neighborhood. Um, 
I guess that's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. Joseph Foley, 511 Ocean House Road, the uh, residential house immediately north of uh, Davis Point Lane, and I have written a couple of times in reference to the proposal. I just would like to take just a couple of minutes to highlight a few things. I'm not going to read everything I've already submitted before, but um, just uh, the lighting that was just talked about at the end. I am concerned about the pole lighting and the outside lighting washing over into our residential area because I think the lighting is going to be up above any buffering that's been mentioned. So I'm concerned about the lighting coming over into our residential neighborhood. Uh, buffering, uh, I heard what Mr. Carroll said, uh, that he feels it's adequate. I don't agree with him. I don't think it's adequate buffering. I think we need additional buffering. I think the buffering needs to be more mature, needs to be higher, wider. And I was very concerned at the site walk to hear about trimming of the materials in the buffering zone. And um, to me, that just is uh, negative to why we're putting buffering in there. I think the buffering should be allowed to grow to its full height and width to do the job that it's required to do. Outside noise, entertainment, um, mentioned that uh, they don't anticipate much of that, but I still think it's an issue that we need to address and we need to somehow or other make sure that um, there's a mechanism to monitor that and if there are complaints that there needs to be something that can be done uh, at the time that the issue uh, is going on and uh, we all know that the code enforcement officer is not around uh, the area at night and he's a long way away so other provisions need to be made Overflow parking is another issue that I'm concerned about. Uh, the agreement with St. Bart's, I think, is a step in the right direction. I'm concerned that this uh, project still um, classifies itself as a convenience store. And to me, a convenience store has a lot of people coming and going as well as a restaurant. So I don't know how that plays into the parking regulations. Uh, I, I really don't think there's adequate parking on site for the number of seats that they want. And uh, parking on Davis Point Lane would, would be within the 100 foot setback that no parking or no structures are supposed to be allowed within. So I don't think parking on Davis Point Lane should be allowed at all. And Davis Point Lane, when it was approved to be upgraded from a dirt road for the Fitzpatrick Ingalls project, was allowed to be. Uh, a narrow width than the town regulations because they were not anticipating uh, much traffic on that road. So that this is not a road that would be able to handle a lot of traffic. I'm also concerned with the 100 foot setback from the residential property lines as I just mentioned that there be no activity of any kind allowed in this area including parking. And I'm concerned on the time frame, the uh, staggered time frame we heard tonight. I don't think that uh, any allowable extension of hours or outdoor seating or any kind should be allowed until all the improvements that are approved by the planning board are done and in compliance. And the only other thing I'd like to mention is the closing time is that there needs to be a mechanism so that there's a firm and strict closing time so that everybody knows when it is and that it's monitored and enforced. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak concerning the uh, application? My name is Gail Schneider. I live at 511 Ocean House Road, uh, directly abutting um, the building. Well, not directly, but within 40 feet of the abutting the building. Um, uh, it's very clear to me that a lot of thought's been put into this project, and there are certainly some wonderful upgrades to what it is right now, and I appreciate those. And I appreciate what they've done to try and pull in the concerns of the neighborhood. I still do, though, have some concerns. 
Uh, the first one is the outside music and the entertainment that may take place at Rudy's. Um, even the jazz band of the high school would be, in my mind, considered as entertainment. Uh, the prevailing summer winds blow our way. They'll carry this noise towards us, permeating our quiet neighborhood. The back two sides of the patio by the design submitted will be enclosed by a four-foot picket fence. Noise will easily pass through this. Noise will also easily carry up and over the building towards our home with the prevailing winds. They're quite wonderful, cool winds that come our way in the summer. Um, we can already distinctly hear all conversations in the parking lot. There is little in the, uh, provided in the plans to address these sound concerns. There is also no stipulation, although it's verbal, we've heard it tonight, regarding amplification. At the very least, any music and or entertainment should be allowed only inside the building, and there should be no amplification of any kind allowed, um, acoustic instruments only. My second concern is noise enforcement. I know my neighbors have spoken a little bit about this. How will the 65 decibels of noise allowed at the property line be monitored or enforced? Our code, enforcer and code enforcement officer lives about 50 minutes away. Much of the potential invasive noise will take place in the evening. How are we going to handle this? If it happens, maybe it won't, but if it does. My third concern um, deals with the overflow parking. We've had a lot of comments about that, and I appreciate the efforts that are made so far. On February 12th, there were 32 cars in the parking lot with the current 39 seats available. The parking lot was full. The proposed plan calls for 25 parking spots for 80 seats. I understand about the um, arrangement now made with St. Bart's, and I think that's a step in the right direction. From the letter I saw from Monsignor Henschel, it granted, um, or intends to grant overflow parking on an occasional <coughs> basis. So I don't know if that means on a nightly basis. I'm just not sure. Um, I'm concerned there will still be overflow parking in our neighborhood, in front of our homes. Um, currently, as the police chief told us, parking is allowed in the bike lanes in the residential district. Um, we did talk to him, and he sent us an email to that, um, that understanding. Parking in front of the homes will be another intrusion to the peace and quiet of our neighborhood. So I am concerned about parking that can't occur on the road in front of Rudy's in the BA zone, but can occur in the RA zone. So that is a concern. Another concern is the activity within the 100-foot buffer. It looks like a great green spot there with grass. Um, the BA code mandates that no parking be allowed in a 100-foot buffer between a business and the residential neighborhood if the business wants to stay open until 10 and have outside seating. I'm hoping that the planning board is willing to stipulate that no activity be allowed in this 100-foot buffer. Um, at the site plan, we've heard discussion, just purely discussion about possible picnic tables, possible lobster cooker. Um, actually, maybe that was earlier than the site plan. But we have heard some rumblings about it. Um, I would love the board to stipulate that no activity take place there. The intent of the BA ordinance was to provide a visual and sound buffer for the adjacent neighbors with this 100-foot setback. Uh, my last concern revolves around the completion of the project. Um, is Rudy's able to increase its hours to 10 and 311s and have outside seating upon planning board approval of the proposed site plan? Um, I feel that all improvements per site plan approval should be completed before extending the hours and allowing outside seating. I'm especially concerned about the phases that were talked about tonight and the possibility of relocating the outside seating so it would not have as much buffering from the building. Um, I'm also concerned about the buffering along Davis Point Lane, that side of the property. My home is within 40 feet of Rudy's property line. I don't think there's enough mature plantings to adequately buffer the increased sound intrusions. Um, I would ask you to please carefully consider the impact our, on our neighbors as you consider Rudy's expansion proposal. Please, please help preserve and be respectful of our quiet and peaceful residential neighborhood and help us to coexist um, in a good way. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Good evening. My name is Carl Best. I live at 12 Townview Road. My, uh, my property abuts Davis Point Road. Um, back again. Uh, I just want to reiterate some of the concerns that, that uh, Pat highlighted as well as some of the other people who got up. Um, I can't necessarily speak for my, my neighbors, but you know, we're, we're leery about you know, good ideas in our neighborhood. Uh, uh, in my opinion, it's, it's been forever uh, changed by the uh, initial project that is there awaiting auction. And, um, and basically, uh, you know, my property value, that of those who live around me, uh, has suffered. And, uh, and the town saw fit to approve the first neighborhood project, and that's it's, uh, as it is. Uh, it, I think it's bad enough that we've had to look at, uh, at that every day. We go outside, we, we look out of our windows, it's the first thing we see. And now I fear that uh, we in the neighborhood will be forced to have to listen to uh, the next phase. Um, and that, with respect to Rudy's, is, is, uh, is what I'm talking about, and we've done all that we can. Uh, we wrote our emails, we sat in at the workshops, we attended these meetings, uh, we put up uh, window blinds, drapes, and we even erected fences. And so now I look to the town council to, to help to uphold uh, you know, some of our rights of privacy here. Uh, I remind you all that the area around Rudy's, as well as the other BA district is uh, in town, is still a residential area with far more homes and businesses. And uh, you know, our jobs, our lifestyles are not seasonal, um, they're year round. And, uh, you know, I fear that uh, we're forced to have to, you know, listen for more potential noise in that area. It's only going to serve to downgrade the area further. Um, first, I, I, I've got several issues of contention. First, I see the proposed plan for Rudy's. Um, I've seen it go through the stages. I've watched as one approval after the other, another has been granted. And while I appreciate the design changes that were made to help uh, situate the noise and traffic away from the nearby residents. The prospects of any outside entertainment uh, would undermine all of that. Uh, the, the entertainment has to be kept indoors. Uh, it absolutely cannot be allowed. It's a gross uh, infringement on everybody's right to privacy. Not only uh, serves to, to further damage the property values but in that area, but uh, any business that has a negative impact on the residents around that, I think, in BA zone should be limited uh, in its scope of operations or even eliminated altogether. Uh, second, the screening proposed in the green space uh, abutting Davis Point Road fails pretty miserably when you consider uh, not so much the amount, but the type of vegetation, vegetation that's slated for the site. Uh, if it's only going to offer foliage only six months out of the year, then it's going to appear very much like it does at the Fitzpatrick building there. Uh, if you scrolled up there, you'd see no vegetation. Uh, so it, it doesn't really help. So I would hope that something fast-growing evergreens would be substituted and a better way of screening the, uh, the noise as well as uh, the headlight wash. Uh, the way I see it, it's, it, you know, it's, it's Rudy's traffic, headlight wash, and noise. Therefore, it's Rudy's responsibility to keep it from spilling over to the, to the abutters. Uh, lastly, my worst fear is overflow parking. Um, I'm a little skeptical about the parking at the uh, church, um, but because I live near Rudy's, I, I think that myself and neighbors shouldn't be subject to people parking in front of our homes or turning around in our driveways at night. Uh, because I live near Rudy's, we shouldn't be subjected to people walking through our property at night. And because we live near Rudy's, I don't think we should be subjected to late night noise or disturbances of any kind. Uh, in short, we just don't need any more good ideas. Uh, I hope that the town council will do everything in its power to uphold the high standards and reputation that have long been associated with our town. And I trust that the town will also provide adequate enforcement of any and all plans that they approve. Just one, we're the planning board, not the town council, so. <laughs> Thanks. Anyone else wishing to speak concerning the uh, application? Anyone else wishing to speak concerning the uh, application of Rudy's? <clears throat> Scott Irving, I live over on Crescent View Ave. Um, so I've been here pretty close to 30 years, I think 28th this summer actually. And just an observation, I mean, Rudy's in that time has varied 
A fair amount. A uh, good part of the time it's kind of been a bit of an eyesore as you come down 77, quite honestly, in the past few years it's gotten up quite a bit better than it used to be. Looking at this site plan, it certainly looks like it's going to be a whole lot better than it's ever been. Uh, so it seems to me that this was being proposed as a substantial improvement to the existing. And uh, so I think for the, the majority of people in the area, I think it would be good. Um, the idea of uh, evergreens versus deciduous trees probably would make some, warrant some looking at, I guess. Um, although I suspect there are standards and things that can be applied for what the sound deadening property of various plants are. And I would presume somebody's done that study. Uh, it seems like the work's been done pretty well. Uh, and someone can probably pretty well calculate the sound volume at the, at the boundaries. Uh, I would also observe that uh, I can think of a few acoustic instruments that are a whole lot louder than an amplifier can be, so I'm not sure if amplified versus acoustic is really a good uh, method for determining, and I would think you would leave that to be the, uh, the sound level at the boundaries. And uh, it seems to me that police are probably fully capable of checking that so we don't need the code enforcement officer staying up late um, so I would think there would be an enforcement method available so anyway overall I think it's, it looks like a really nice plan and I think it's an improvement thank you thank you anyone else wishing to speak concerning the uh, application Hi, my name is Erin Grady and I live at Two Emerald Way. I'm not a neighbor of Rudy's, but I go there for dinner probably once a week. And I think it's been a great improvement what's been done there over the past couple of years. I too have lived in town for about 45 years and I remember when we'd rush to Rudy's at midnight for last call, so it used to be a package store and there was a lot more going on in the parking lot back in the day than there is now. And I think it's a great asset to our town and I think the plan looks awesome. And I look forward to being able to bring more people there. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Michelle Buckley. I live directly across the street at 526 Ocean Hills. And I do think it's a beautiful plan and it's a great improvement, but I just want to emphasize the fact of the noise in the area. It's not, I mean, they do the best as they can, but having outdoor seating, it's going to be a big issue. It's just the nature of the beast. It's the way it is there. It's the way the sound travels. And outdoor entertainment, it's just going to be unbearable. Inside, I don't see any issue with that at all. But I think you really need to, need to take a, a good look at, you know, the outside seating area. I think that's, I think that's going to be the one issue, that and the possible parking problems. But otherwise, I mean, I, I think it's a wonderful plan, and they've done a beautiful job with it. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak concerning the application? <clears throat> Anyone else? Going once, <laughs> going twice. I'll close the public hearing and uh, invite the applicant up to the podium to address anything further he wants to address concerning what the uh, issues that were raised. And you might want to stay there. I'm guessing the board may have some questions too. Sure. Um, <coughs> well, I guess when I summarize what I thought some of the issues were, I guess I kind of hit it pretty close to kind of what people's comments were. So. Well, you've seen the same letters we have, but go ahead. Um, so as, as far as, I guess I'll go through some of, some of these, I wrote down some of them and the, some of them I probably missed, but um, uh, I think Mr. Best was talking about lighting levels at the uh, spilling over onto his property, and um, I just want to show, show him here. Um, I wish I was quicker with this computer, but uh, 
Um, these light levels along the property line, as you can see, is 0 0.1, 0 0.1. And once you get out kind of towards uh, Davis Point Road, they really drop down to zero. I mean, there is actually no light uh, from this project, from, the, from any of the site lighting that's proposed for this project that is spilling over the property line anywhere along here. And then once you get down onto Route 77, uh, there's a small little bit of it that kind of spills out kind of through here. And then it, again, it's, it's down to, it's, it's very close to zero all the way around. So I think, you know, I, I think in the old days when uh, we had kind of pole or light fixtures mounted on telephone poles and, uh, you know, they were, they were throwing light in all directions, including up, um, that uh, light spillage was an issue. And, and uh, I'm sure we've all lived in places where that light is coming in your bedroom window all night long. But that won't be the case here. These are kind of uh, high-performance lighting fixtures. They throw light down and not out. And the lenses are kind of designed to be very specific about where the light's thrown. So um, I guess I just like you guys to trust us and trust the calculations that were done by the lighting manufacturer on this that, uh, that in fact, um, these light fixtures are, are uh, going to do the job. Um, as far as buffering goes, um, um, it, it's not entirely true that we have that we have uh, all deciduous plantings along here. We have actually, I think there are nine evergreen trees, and these trees are a mixture of, I believe, pine and and spruce, and. Um, the intent for those, those, those will get to be 40 to 60 feet tall as they mature. And Sorry, what were those again? What type are they? Yeah, you said Aust it. Austrian pine and balsam fir, I'm sorry. Um, so they will get to be kind of good sized dense trees and they, they by themselves will form a pretty dense kind of evergreen hedge. And then what we've done is kind of infill in front of those as, as an additional kind of understory or mid-story layer, a massing of Ragosa roads. So this is not going to be, I know that the planting is pretty sparse on the uh, business center. And it really just hasn't, hasn't grown well and, and it's not, you know, there's, there's some pretty good sized gaps in there. Uh, this Ragosa rose, if, if any of you have it in your yard, you know that it's, it's pretty tough to control. It spreads very quickly and it forms a pretty dense hedge that, uh, uh, while it is deciduous, it is thick and um, almost impenetrable. I mean, once it, once it gets filled in there, uh, one of the other advantages of that is that it's, it's really going to kind of very much restrict or prohibit people from cutting uh, across the property through there, you know, I even walk. from these neighbors walking, yes. I think Maureen had a question. I just wanted you to explain, being a landscape architect, why you chose to include some deciduous trees in there instead of just planting a complete evergreen tree buffer. Well, I think we were trying to kind of loosen it up so it didn't feel like this kind of very uniform kind of dense hedge of sorts, but to try to break it up. Um, and, and where we've included the deciduous trees, there's one in the corner here. and, and the reason we didn't put an evergreen tree here is because this is probably an area that's going to get snow is going to get piled up in here, and so we wanted to pull the evergreen trees back so that because those branches will be down to the ground and we just didn't want snow piling up on those. Whereas a deciduous tree can can handle some snow snow piling up. Uh, there's a there's a deciduous tree back here, and I think that is a uh, it's a river birch. And the reason, the reason we put that there and kind of planted some, some larger shrubs around it, there's actually a low spot drainage-wise back in here that, uh, that's kind of a leftover from when they built the road in the parking lot here. And it doesn't really drain. And so part of our grading plan is actually to, to, to be able to, to grab that 
that low area and drain it out this way into our culvert and, and on out and down. Um, so we kind of had to leave this area open a little bit. We had to stop the berm about right in here. And uh, this river birch is a, is a tree that can um, stand pretty wet feet. And uh, if, in fact, that area does collect water, it's, it's a good tree to put in there. Um, so these are balsam firs in here. Those balsam firs, those are your typical um, Christmas tree. But they do grow dense, and they keep branches down, to the, down lower to the ground. Um, these are Austrian pines in here. And we put Austrian pines in here for a couple reasons. One is the fact that they're very fast growing. Um, and the second is that they're very dense. And um, um, the one thing about the Austrian pines is that they tend to lose some of their lower branches as they, as they mature. And so that's, that's really the reason why we've supplemented in front of those with this massing of Ragosa Rose and Bayberry. So that's kind of the concept behind all of this. And, um, you know, we could probably add a couple more evergreen trees in there if that would, if that would help. But I know that, you know, uh, Joel, when he did his project, he planted four evergreen trees on the other side of Davis Point Road. And, you know, we're planting nine over here. So we're more than doubling the evergreen trees. and Less distance too, right? Within a smaller area. Within a smaller area, yes. So, um, and we're also providing, we've got a, about a two to three foot berm that runs parallel with Davis Point Road to kind of help, help kind of, again. That's where the road, the Ragosa is going, correct? They're going kind of on one side of the, of the berm and then the, the evergreen trees that go up on top. So you get some initial greater height out of the trees initially. Because of the berm. Because of the berm. And the berm will also help the berm and the rugosa will help with headlights too. I mean, Mr. Best proposed a fast. Is he still here? Growing evergreen. I, I don't know what he had in mind. Well, that's yeah. Other than an arborvitae hedge of some sort, but uh, which could work. But um, it's. I mean, this is much more naturalistic and more in keeping, I think, with uh, with Cape Elizabeth and than a formal arborvitae hedge along that. Okay. Any other questions on this issue? Go ahead, Pat. You're still responding. So. Um, the noise issue, I think, um, I think there was a comment made that, you know, it's probably best to just leave it, leave it as an enforcement issue. Um, I think uh, Paul is right that, uh, you know, there can be some Acoustic music that's as loud as some amplified music. That's Scott. Pardon? That was Scott that said that. Or Scott, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Paul's his son. <laughs> um, but, uh, um, but I think that, uh, you know, I don't think the intent here is to really be providing entertainment. The intent is to be providing food and a gathering place, and the music is really a background to that. And that's, that's the intent. We're not trying to provide, you know, concerts or kind of, um, you know, major venues here or entertainment. It's really, the, the music is really a background to, to the gathering. I mean, I, I understand what you're saying about acoustic versus amplified. I agree it's probably a better idea to, to leave it as the standards. There's still the entertainment license you would have to apply to, so that may be a further opportunity to restrict. But, you know, one, one thing I didn't quite um, sort of buy is the three months a year because that's the same three months the neighbors are outside enjoying the outside as well and well, frankly true. you know may, maybe some sort of uh, agreement or or at the time the entertainment license is, is granted that that there would be nights off that there were sort of block up periods when they know they could count on no music um, as a way to compromise so that it's not 90 or 120 days of, of, of music. I'm, I'm doubt, doubting that's going to happen anyway because I know, you know, some nights are naturally slower than others. But um, it seems to me that, that if, if noise becomes an issue, it is going to be enforcement primarily, but also in terms of being a good neighbor, maybe coming up with a, some sort of way to, to preserve a little quieter on other days. Um, but go ahead. That's, that's fair. That's fair. Um, Regarding some of the comments about how noise travels, um, you know, the reason that that the uh, turnpike puts up 
kind of concrete kind of baffles along the highway is because something solid is the only thing that really kind of um, absorbs or directs sound. It's, uh, landscaping by itself will not, will not uh, have any impact at all on sound. And uh, it's, it's unfortunate because, you know, it'd be great for my business if, if we could kind of go in and kind of just be doing all these great planting plans and kind of solving the world's sound problems. But um, it really doesn't have any effect at all. And, um, and that's one of the reasons why we've, we've actually located on the south side to use the building and the solid fencing that's on two sides of this outdoor dining to really kind of hold that sound in. And, um, and we think that, that it will be pretty effective at doing that. And if anything, it's going to direct sound more towards the good table than, than back towards the residential neighbors. Um, if you're about to leave that noise issue, I have a question. Mm -hmm. I'd appreciate some clarification, maybe for Maureen. And that is, if this is a restaurant that brings in a guitar player, does that require an entertainment permit? At what point is an entertainment license needed? Because it, it seems to me that our regulations don't give us many tools for regulating the kinds of things that need to be regulated and thought about when you have entertainment, but I'm not sure when, what entertainment is and at what point this establishment would qualify for needing that. And, and I'm not going to try to speculate on that. I can tell okay. you that an entertainment license is granted by the town council, that the town center cafe that the planning board recently granted site plan approval for has since gone to the town council and gotten an entertainment license. So I, I don't know where the breaking point is. Um, I'm, I would suggest that the, the planning board focus on the site plan standards. Right. Yes. It's, 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 it just seems that a lot of this discussion, while interesting and important, really is not within our jurisdiction. Right. Mm -hmm. In terms of the... In terms of the acoustic. entertainment and, and anything other than actually measuring noise, which we, we have fairly clear standards for, and, and any particular instance of noise can be measured. but. Beyond that, I'm not sure we have tools to work with. I agree with you. Yeah, and I, I found the same thing. I spent some time looking through the materials that we rely on, and the, the noise standards are it that, in that's terms a, of that, reference in the, in the site plan reviews. And I, I just, someone just handed me, um, one of my fellow members here, the uh, licensing standards, which I won't read, but all of the things that you all have been discussing clearly are addressed in the license and permit provision. And so I think all of your neighbors' concerns are very definitely relevant and um, able to be addressed by um, the town council, I guess, that mm. would ultimately the approve the kind of license that would be required for under the definition of entertainment, which I can read because I think it's useful here any amusement, performance, exhibition, or diversion for patrons or customers of the licensed premises. It goes on, so it seems to me that everything we've been talking about um, is possibly subject to this other town standard that the town council would be considering. So that would be a separate license yes. that, that Rudy's would have to apply for before they could... Uh... Do anything do within anything this definition right. of entertainment, which on a very quick reading looks like it covers much of what's been discussed tonight. Okay. And I guess the last item that, uh, that I'd like to comment on is uh, a little bit on overflow parking. Again, um, you know, the, I mean, the ordinance is pretty clear on, on kind of what the standard is, and that is, and we have met that standard on site. We're, we're willing to kind of... Um, work with the board and work with the town and work with the neighbors on kind of where and how much overflow parking and where it occurs. And, you know, right now we have an agreement with um, St. Bart's to, to park there. Um, I think it's, you know, it's a matter of enforcement within the, within Rudy's where, you know, there's going to have to be some signage that says, you know, if it's full, don't park on the road, park, you know, park and walk 400 feet to to the parking lot, and um, 
I guess we'll just have to see how it goes. And you know, I mean, if it if it if it ends up being that, that you can't, I mean, they can also park on Broadcove Road. But if it, if it, I guess if it, uh, if it ends up being an issue, I think you know maybe we come back and revisit. Um, but um, it, it seems like we're we're trying to accommodate a, an unknown at this point. Uh, we have met the ordinance, and um, you know we'll you know we're. we're We'll work with the town as best we can, but um, I mean, right now that's what we've got is, is some minimal parking perhaps on Broad Cove Road and some overflow parking in St. Bart's and some overflow parking accommodated on site here. And uh, that's our proposal. Okay. I have one more question on parking. No, go ahead. Um, Please. There's been some discussion as to once this becomes a restaurant, whether it will also continue to be a retail store is the, and perhaps that's been the site plan and that the floor plan as I see it looks like once this work is done what we have here is a restaurant and not a convenience store anymore it's converted from one use to the other but if in fact the intention is to do both then it, it seems possible that there are, you know, there are parking requirements for stores and there are parking requirements for restaurants your parking calculation addresses only a restaurant use. If there is a dual use here, I wonder whether perhaps there is some additional parking required by the ordinance. Yeah, I think at this point in time, it, the use will become a restaurant. OK. Because um, there's been some discussion in the description about perhaps that during the day, it isn't just a restaurant. But at night, it's just a restaurant. And so I'm, think, I'm really not clear ever, what the intention is. I don't think we've ever described that in any of our narratives as far part of this application. I mean, there may have been some informal kind of discussions very early on. Well, yeah, the application title talks about a convenience store. Right. I mean, I don't That's why I was. Um, but in fact, it does seem like the finished site plan would be a restaurant. So perhaps I mean, if you, look at, if you look at the floor plan, the floor plan clearly is a restaurant. It's, uh, I mean, there aren't. No refrigerated cases or anything. Right. Are those I didn't see any fixturing sure. for a convenience store that would remain <clears throat> after it becomes, after this expansion. No, you know, I mean, er, very early on, we had some discussions with, um, um, geez, his name. Throwing a blank now, but the man who's uh, running, Mr. Barnes, Chuck Barnes, who's actually managing the store now, managing the restaurant, about the idea. He had he had an idea of taking kind of the right hand side and closing it off and, and turning that into a convenience store. And um, at that point in time, we said, you know, if you do that, and I think I might have even had a conversation with Maureen about that that we would have to accommodate the additional parking that would be required for the convenience store in addition to the, to the number of seats that would be required. And um, that's not in the picture at all. That doesn't reflect in any of the floor plans. And um, that's where we're Do you want to say something? <laughs> <laughs> OK, so do, do these things say convenience store anywhere still? Just the yeah. only. Hey. That was the only thing I read. Okay. Was the title. Right. If you look at the motion for the board to consider, it only grants approval approval for a restaurant. So if there is any confusion, if you vote on that motion, then the only thing you've given them approval for is a restaurant. Is a restaurant. Okay. You all set? I'm all set. For now. I think one thing we need to hash out quite clearly is the uh, proposed stepwise approval that they're looking at because my, I mean, you grant site plan approval, they go pull a building permit, they do the work, once they get their occupancy permit, they're entitled to do what the approval says. And I don't know, short of that, whether we have the authority to say, well, you've expanded your parking, use what you have with extended hours. I mean, I'm, 
I just don't think we can. I mean, let's go ahead. Do you have a different view on that, or? Yeah, I would. I would strongly urge the planning board to be um, crystal clear in what you're approving. When um, any application has had any kind of a step or the word is phase, um, you've actually received a plan that has phase one, phase two, phase three. So if there is a, an intermediary step here, I would urge the board to consider requesting a plan that shows what the intermediary phase is because it will be very difficult. You will basically be leaving it up to the code office to determine how much of the site plan you've approved has to be done by what time. And you may, he may not hit the point, the phase or the amount of work that you expected to have done. Before the hours. Right, which is why, you know, you put it on a plan and then there's much less room for interpretation. And, and you're, are you thinking that a note? I'm thinking there should be a separate plan that says phase one and then, a, and then this plan would be phase two. Yeah, I, I agree because quite honestly, just based on what we've heard tonight, there's nowhere near enough detail for me to feel comfortable. I, I'm not even sure Mr. Carroll knew <laughs> what the detail was that, that he was addressing, and no, no offense, but you know, there's just no, not enough detail and not enough definitiveness about it for me to feel comfortable even addressing a phased in. Um, if that's something that they want to do, I think they need to submit that. And essentially a plan that we can approve. Right, that says phase one. When you do this, well, right. you're entitled to, uh, to extended hours with existing building. Absolutely. I agree. Does that, now let's just play devil's advocate here. Let's assume nothing else ever happens after that. They've done the outside work, although they're essentially leaving it, which in a way would be foolish because they would still have a smaller restaurant with more out with right. changed outside parking. Less income coming. Well, I know that's why. Yeah. Maybe it's, I'm just hashing it out verbally no. so I don't miss something here. Um, and I'm not trying to get in the way of the plan. I just I agree with Maureen completely that if we're going to do it this way, it needs to be very crystal clear on the record and from the plan. And uh, you know, part of me would ask the applicant. I mean, if, if the, the sense of the board is we want we're considering approval as written, um, we could do that, except they're not going to get their extended hours until they do the building renovations. If the applicant is looking for something different, um, tabling this for another month with the new the, the, the sheet one, and I'm not I'm I'm giving you the option if that's the sense the board is going in, whether you'd want full no, approval. I was, I was actually just talking with Mary, and she said that as long as she can get started on the site work, she doesn't need the extra hour until everything is done. Okay. So you're more interested in, in a potential approval tonight rather than stepwising it. Yes. No, that... And uh, so the extra hour isn't isn't all that critical. Okay. Things and, uh, but it will it. be when when it's all done. Well, the building's done, of course. Sure. That's fair. But it's also no extra seats, no outdoor seating, until everything's complete. Well, yes. Is that right? Or is no, no. What they're saying is they're going to push forward with that in front of us. They're not going to be looking for any kind of step. But I mean, realistically, this summer. When, as I understand it, this summer what's, that's, what's going to be completed is a new parking lot with delineated spaces and all of the Landsca landscaping will be installed and then you're in business all summer, I assume. With existing. Right. And at this point there's approval for 37 seats, which you would keep. Nine, whatever. Or 30, Three, whatever, 30, whatever it is. Nine, whatever, whatever the is. number is now. But I don't believe there's outdoor seating at this point. So that this summer, no outdoor seating would be permitted because that would be a change of use. So that this summer you could do indoor seating mm -hmm. until the same hours. And not until the plan was completely finished could you do any outdoor seating or extend to 80 seats. That's my understanding of it because right. of the kind of unusual, non-complying, grandfathered use that's, that's there now. And if that if that's, meets the plans that are adequate for you for the summer, then you could go with that. Alternatively, you could come back with the phased plan um, I don't, I don't. that would allow other options, but you, that's obviously additional planning work. No. Okay. I think we're happy just forging ahead with one, one plan here. Okay. Any other questions or 
comments from the board before well, I, yeah i have a question about um parking is the ordinance say the maximum number of parkings off site is 25 on site on, on site is 25 no that that's the, the minimum. minimum required for the amount of seats they're proposing in the restaurant Okay. I have that correct? Yes, exactly. Yeah, there are standards that are in the, in the ordinance that talk about different uses. And for a restaurant use, it's, it's one parking space for every four seats plus one space for every employee. Currently, there are three employees at the, at the restaurant. We project that there will be five employees upon completion of the project. 80 seats is 20 spaces, so there's a total of 25 spaces okay. proposed. Okay, minimum. I mean, among other mitigation, I mean, they could ask the employees to park at St. Bart's and sure. free up the interior spots for the customers. Um, when I was looking at the plan, um, I can't see the signs for the compact cars. Is it on the plan? Compact cars? We don't have signs for compact cars. They're all full-size spots. They're all full-size. Full oh, wait a minute. There are we have three spots next to the That's right. We do. Okay. They're, I think... Um, the plan calls for that, uh, the ordinance, excuse me. <coughs> You're right, and I think they are, if I can figure out how to get out of here. Right next to the building. They're right next to the handicap space. Right, there's three. And plan, the ordinance says... Uh, They're right okay, here, Our actually. spaces must be marked, clearly marked. I, I didn't see the signs. Um, there will be signs, right? Uh, there will be signs. We'll put signs up, yes. Okay. And there's yeah, no this is a handicapped spot, yeah. and then these three spaces right here are compact spaces. Um, because it's not paved, next to the handicapped spot, that's an access aisle for van. Yes. Right. How are you going to keep a compact car out of there? Well, it's, we're sh there's, there's a sidewalk here. This is a yeah. paved sidewalk and a curb. Yeah. No, the hash spot that's next to the oh, the access hash. Aisle. The access aisle. Right there. How, right there. how do you make sure no one pulls in there since it's normally on pavement? A well, we'll put a, there's going to be a handicapped parking sign right here. And then the striped dial area will have another handicapped parking sign. I mean, how are they going to know that that's an access aisle that you don't park there? I don't know. I mean, you know. There's going to be a handicapped be. parking sign, and there'll be compact parking signs further down within those, those three spaces there, and I guess... Um, I, I think it's because it's not paved. I mean, it, the ordinance calls for a delineated plan, and that right there is a very well-done delineated plan for a paved parking lot, and it's not paved. Um, so I do have concerns about we are meeting the ordinance as far as a delineated plan goes. So we could put a sign up that says handicap parking aisle, no parking or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, because the ordinance we can, I think we can deal with it with signage. Okay. It would be nice for the people that are using van parking. Well, we clearly want to make sure that, that whoever's parking needs that handicap space right. has adequate space to kind of... Uh, Exactly. Yeah. And I, I still am concerned about that. That's not a paved parking lot. And I think that is brought up um, by the town engineer. He mentioned something about, I'd have to pull out my notes in regards to how that's not paved. In the yeah, and in, in an ideal world, it would be paved. But, uh, you know, it's, it's really a budget thing as much as anything. And I think, I mean, there's... There's quite a few gravel parking lots in Cape right now. And uh, ultimately, <laughs> Anyone else on the board? you know, if the restaurant is successful, they will probably end up being paved. Can we get a commitment to that? Like three years from now, it's paved? I, well, no, I don't know. I mean, it's not required no, to it's be paved. No, it's not required. Does the board have any concerns? I, I don't. Parking? No? No, my only concern on that point was um, if we choose to incorporate the town engineer's letter, which has been proposed, that we be clear as to whether or not we're requiring paving, because the town engineer does suggest that um, in, in his paragraph 7.
I don't know that he's recommending that. Given the scale, it's be the payable up being keeping with the goal of upgrading the, the facilities, but it still complies with the site, site plan standards. That's, that's, I think that's say, stating something stronger than Steve Harding is recommending. I share, I I I share, I I share Victoria's concern about the linear and the handicap area, and that can be covered with signage. Complex Secretary, spots. I, yeah. I guess, Peter, I go back to uh, section 19-7-C, number five. Parking spaces and travel aisles should be clearly delineated. Well, I, I, that's why I think the, the signage along there complies with delineation. It doesn't mean on the surface or with a, with a paved surface. But I agree with you, Peter, that, interpretation. that we shouldn't, that we don't need to require it. What troubles me is if we simply incorporate Steve Harding's letter, given the last sentence there that he says, given the scale of the improvements in the building of the site, it would appear that a paid lot would be in keeping with the goals of upgrading the facility. I, I don't see that as, as... If I were the applicant, I would prefer... Yeah, no, I... Am, <laughs> that, that we're not I, required. I think the record's pretty clear as to what they're proposing, so, I mean, I'll, I'll leave that up to the applicant, but what does is, what is the proposed motion say? Incorporates revised. The, incorporates the letter. I mean, say except paragraph seven. Yeah, well, or the last sentence, just the last sentence, because he's making some other recommendations. Because we do, in fact, want the applicant to do what's in the first. Well, that's what I mean. First paragraph, right? Yeah. I wouldn't. Yeah. I wouldn't delete the whole paragraph. I would delete just the last sentence. Right. Any other concerns, questions, comments, thoughts, suggestions? Um, is the applicant proposing that they will have a crosswalk? No, I think what they, what they said on the record, and correct me if I'm wrong, Pat, is that if the town allows them, they will install a crosswalk across them. So if they do receive but, a but the town, place. Yeah, the, no, the town, no, the town is, is the issue there, isn't it, that right now? Well, in, in previous discussions Mary had with the town, she was led to believe that it was really a DOT issue. Oh, meaning uh, to allow her to go do it. Yes. Regardless right. of the St. Bart's parking issue. Right. Um, but in my conversations with Bob Malley, it's part of the, the, the compact zone that right. the town has with DOT. So the town really controls um, everything along that road. So I guess that's what I was trying to clarify with Bob was, was whether or not you know, it is a town issue or a DOT issue. It is a state highway, so, um, you know, adding a crosswalk across the state highway could be an issue. I don't know. Uh, Meaning in and of itself or just getting whoever, of, whomever's permission? In and, well. Or both. Or both, yeah. I mean, my, I'm hopeful that it's really, it's, it's in Bob's court and he can just say, yes, let's put a crosswalk there. But if he says it's out of my hands, it's the state's issue. Right then you go ask the state. Right. I mean, I was asking Maureen last week. I said, you know, I can't think of anywhere else in town that has a crosswalk except right out here, I think. You guys just both. You mean on 77? On 77. I think there's only one that, that's right out Somebody here. had to approve that one, then, I'm assuming. Unless the town did it on its own. Or they just without asking. asked your forgiveness instead of permission. <laughs> right. Is it a rogue crosswalk? <laughs> I know so I guess my, my only concern would be that, you know, if, if Mary goes out there and stripes a crosswalk... And that, finds uh, out you're not supposed to. <laughs> that, you know, there's some liability no, there. I'm, and, uh, clearly. I, I guess the, what I heard clearly on the record, and I'm happy to put in the approval condition, that upon obtaining the appropriate permission, the applicant agrees to install it, right? Isn't that what you said on the record yeah. before? Yeah. Can we require a parking agreement with St. Bart's, or can we, do we have the authority to do that since they've met the 20 Well, that's, that's, that last phrase is the one I'm concerned about. Is the answer is if they needed it, sure. You, we've done that in the past. We did that because... But they have their 25 spaces on site. Well, so and they're meeting the ordinance, I well, guess. Well, that's why I don't know that we can require that. We can steer them in that direction. Um, Wasn't the issue with them by, in by the sea that they needed, they needed additional it. spaces Absolutely. for their that's event memory. parking? Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 So that's different. It is. Right. Can we make that a condition of our approval, Maureen? Yes, we can. What that they? If you want to make an agreement with, yes, say parts. You you have the ordinance. I mean, if the applicant doesn't, if the applicant was objecting to it, 
mm. then you'd want to be a lot more cautious. Mm -hmm. The applicant is offering this as an option. And there is evidence on the record from at least one abutter that suggests that parking in addition to what the minimum requirement is may be appropriate. Okay. Hearing. Okay. Have we heard the number of spaces that would be provided? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure if we, if we want to do something. If we don't have the we don't have the detail. Don't we don't have it. any details of that. Well, I don't know. The deal I think they had with uh, in by the sea did require a minimum number of spots that the same parts would keep available. Yeah. But it had opposite hours pretty well tightly controlled. I'm not sure you're going to get that with Rudy's because. The masses overlap. Right. They're operating hours more so than the in by the sea. So, I mean, you could have end up with a situation where they have an as available type agreement with St. Parts, and someone goes over there, and St. Parts is full because something's going on over there. But I'm not clear what the applicant is offering here, as part of this application package. Well, we have a letter from Father Henschel. We have a copy of that letter. We do. You yeah, we do. Which says he's willing to. I don't have in front of me, but I remember reading it this week. He's willing to have spaces available, and as it moves forward, to provide a written agreement to that effect. If I remember right. I may. Um, this is from um, Monsignor Henschel, St. Bartholomew Parish, dated March 9. To Mary Page of Rudy's in Cape Elizabeth, dear Mary, having been made aware of your possible need for overflow parking on an occasional basis, I am happy to offer such space in our parking lot on terms similar to those we have worked out successfully with the Inn by the Sea. Our recent phone conversation and the success of our arrangement with the Inn make me confident that details can be worked out to our mutual satisfaction. Please feel free to convey this information as needed to the town. I also have here the, uh, the email part that, that went with that attachment from Father Henschel that I'd like to read into the record if Please. you want. Please. Do we have that? Uh, I'm not sure you do. You, I oh, sent yeah. it all to you. No, I believe I'm just, uh, I don't, says, Mary, I don't remember reading it. You got it at the same time you did. Okay. It says, Mary, I've attached the letter we spoke of earlier this week. I think this should meet your needs. Obviously, we will have to work out a few details between us in a bit more detail, but I would think that this should satisfy the town. With the inn, we have something formal that was worked out with our attorney just to make it completely clear. That is easy to do and shouldn't cost anything either. I could send him the basic outline of what we're doing and we could have someone something quickly, I would assume. It simply spells out some days and times so you don't conflict with our needs, mostly on Sunday morning when you would certainly not have a problem anyway. And it specifies the insurance coverages and hold harmless. Sincerely, Monsignor Mitchell. So I think, you know, he's fully aware of what, what he necessary. needs to do to protect himself and their, their uses and, um, and accommodate Mary. So. And since the Inn by the Sea did specify a number of spaces, if it sounds as though if he's willing to use that model, then a number of spaces could be specified, which would mean that if we have a number of spaces in mind, we could specify, we could specify for example, an arrangement for not less than 10 spaces, 15 spaces, I don't know, no one's raised a number, so we would have to come up with one. But it seems to me, without that kind of specificity, we're really not putting any teeth in what we're doing here. And in connection with that, I think a crosswalk, we should memorialize that also. If it's... Easy. Getting all this down? Yeah. No. yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm leaning on my motion writer over there. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to wait just a minute so Beth can write. <laughs> the 33 space parking lot is overflowing, which it must be because I've certainly seen cars on the road. And we now have 25. We have to at least get to well over 33. Do you have a number of mine? 15, maybe? Yeah. Oh, that? Works for me. I mean, there's nothing we can really hang our hat on other than gut feel, really. And if there's some open there, there's usually a lot open there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or it's full up. There is nothing. Yeah. yeah. There's no in between. But I would rather to see the language in there. Yeah. That's fine. 
I, I don't think they're going to have a trouble with the number. I mean, even if no. you have a 20. As I long as it's church. not on Easter Sunday. Well, yeah. <laughs> That's after. Or when there's a wedding. Or... Yeah. That's a big parking lot, though. Oh, yeah. How big is the lot and what's been promised to the in by the sea? Well, my memory was that was 40. But yeah. What was 40? The in by the sea number? But I'd have to look at it. To... Does that ring a bell? <laughs> Maybe. That's the number that's in my head, too, is 40. Okay. Liz Barber, she would remember. She would remember. That's true. <laughs> so I don't know what we do if Henschel comes back and says, now I'll give you 10, when we say 15. I don't know. I don't know why he would. I, I, that's what I'm looking at. It's a big law. So, yeah. Very. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. That's why I don't think pegging that number is going to be a problem. Okay. I can live with 15. Okay. Um, and we're yep. still, we're in, in the crosswalk, we still, we're adding the, in the crosswalk, okay. I think that needs to be simple as, as simple as the applicant has agreed to install a crosswalk as soon as the appropriate permissions are granted. I mean, I don't think, I think it sounds like the applicant's trying to do that now, regardless of this application. Beth, I'll follow your lead, so when, take your okay, time, and when you're ready to no, offer a motion, I'll give you... I think I've got it all. <laughs> the only two additions I have are the overflow parking and the crosswalk. Now, um, I want to ask, before I offer the motion, I want to ask one question about the town engineer's letter. Do we want to limit the um, revisions on the plan to the town en engineer's letter, not including the second paragraph of number seven. There's some concern about or question right. about the reference in there about reviewing uh, gravel versus paved. I, uh, the first paragraph seems to be with the wheel stops. But we're I understand that. And that would be my inclination, would be to, to keep the to proposed the right. second paragraph. Of so the plans seven. we revised did except for second paragraph. Second paragraph of number seven. Okay. We obviously share the concerns that the town engineer raises in the second paragraph there. Um, and as Victoria pointed out, some marking of those spaces, dashed lines that appear on the plan but can't appear on a gravel lot, some substitute for those does have to occur. And maybe that's, that's the third extra point to, to add. Mm -hmm. Beth is to is that the uh, the applicant would would uh, add signage to delineate whatever the phrase yeah. is. Yeah. For the compact. Huh? Yeah. And something about keeping the access aisle open. We've got to add signage to delineate the required Com um, compact spaces. The compact spaces, the handicap spaces, and the, full and, the no, and the no parking. Right in the full width of the handicap space or something like that. some other areas on the plan which are shown with cross striping yeah. which is intended to indicate no parking um, perhaps we could say or could require that areas that are shown as cross striped on the plan that are going to be on a gravel parking surface will require appropriate park uh, signage I had included the no parking areas in the in the um, list of no parking areas designated by signage where cross hatching on the gravel surface is not feasible. Cross striping on the gravel surface is not feasible because it actually flies around the back of the building. Yeah, if I could, if I could comment on that. Um, that striped area in the back is actually the service it's area. Loading and yeah. service. I actually and, included that uh, on the list. There should be a there should be a sign there that says loading or service area. And we're also that was also an area where we were we were 
uh, recommending that somebody with a truck and a trailer could potentially pull up and park there. Mm -hmm. um, During business uh, hours. Yeah. So, and that would be signed as such. Okay. But I think that one little triangular area there clearly could be, could be signed as no parking. And uh, we can clearly designate kind of around the handicap space for no parking, or for, you have to make sure that that's kept free for handicap parking. Okay. I'm running out of space here. We wrote too big at the beginning. No, I've got it. No, I've got it. I'll just, I'm, I'm wrestling with the no parking areas because we've really only got two that wouldn't be designated. One would be the access to the handicap, and, and then there's this, that triangle as you go around the, around the corner. Um, While she's writing that, maybe just for the record, um, for the neighbors, um, we haven't talked about Davis Point Road, and we haven't talked about parking along um, in, the, in the road in the front. Maybe just for well, the, the record, police we chief has mentioned whose jurisdiction and any concerns over that parking spot, whose attention that should be brought to, and why we're not really addressing it tonight. Yeah. I think that's me. Um, yeah, the, uh, I <laughs> did send out uh, several queries to the police chief regarding different places people could park and where they allowed. And the answer on Davis Point Road is it is private. So um, the police department would not be enforcing any parking on Davis Point Road. It's a private road, and the owner of Davis Point Road would be the one responsible for, um, the, for enforcing no parking there. The owner could install no parking signs. The owner could contract with a towing company to actually tow cars out of there if they do park there. But it's, it's beyond the scope of the town's authority because it's a private road. And who owns that? I'm just curious. I can't remember Mr. how. Mr. Ingalls. Oh, it's part of his project. Yes. Oh, he needs some revenue. <laughs> I also wanted to say for the public record, but I don't think it's part of our motion that We've spent a lot of time here and in the town council in designing the BA ordinance and the compatibility standards, the architectural standards, the landscaping standards, how we wanted things to present themselves to the, to the road frontage. And I think Rudy's has done an excellent job with the plans here in really doing the things that our new ordinance envisions along the road front here. And I just really wanted to thank you all for for true. doing that, I think it's a really good true. example of what we were hoping to see in the VA zone architecturally and, and landscaping-wise. Yeah. All right, I have a motion for the board to consider. Um, are we done? No. Just, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Have I thought we you talked about noise? Well, I don't know what else. What else? Do you have a question or a comment on the noise? Well, are we just going to totally leave it with the um, town council to take up the entertainment? Issue or it's all we can we, do, really, isn't it? Well, um, I gotta find my notes. Actually, we could make stipulations, um, and it has been done. It was done with the in by the sea. They actually, um, I was able to go back to find that original planning board meeting, and they made the hours that they would have entertainment from. I, Maureen could check this with me on 11 o'clock to 8 o'clock, and they said anything after 8. So the planning board set those hours. So mm -hmm. they did address the issue of noise. And I'm wondering, are we going to address it, or is this going to be something we're passing on? What, what do you propose? Um, well, I would like to see Rudy's with its great plan. It, it looks wonderful. I'm not hearing anything about opposing Rudy's. I'm hearing parking, noise, buffering. And sure. I think we should address noise. And I'm just hearing the people saying, have your entertainment if you decide to go with a license indoors. Just please, not outdoors. Mm. I would actually say um, no entertainment outdoors. That's what you like is a condition of approval. It is a condition of approval. I'm wondering what the board thinks. Any precedents there, Maureen? Yep. And that is? The, uh, well, Victoria is, is said it correctly. I mean, the is inside it? of the sea had, um, they were basically non conforming with their site plan approval because they had never come forward to the board with a request to have outdoor events 
and when they brought that forward, they had issues, three different issues, and one of them was noise. Uh, that particular applicant did a noise study where they measured the decibel level mm. at the property line, and they determined that they wanted to have outdoor music, and they agreed to install sound blankets on the sides of the tents when they had outdoor music so that they could keep the decibel level at the maximum that's allowed at the property line. I can see keeping it indoors because I, you, you get some kids that may want to play something, they'll, they'll crank it up outside. And, um, right. I can see a problem. Rather than just enforcement. So not an hours restriction, but inside. I would say inside. And I, I've heard tonight that it's not going to be a place for entertainment. It's a place to go enjoy a good meal. Right. So I don't think it's the intent for an entertainment site. But still, I wouldn't limit the entertainment on the inside. I'm just saying you, I'd like you, to address it tonight, and I would like to... No, that's fine. I'm trying to understand what your proposal is, which is to, to limit it to just inside the building. So if they decide to go with an entertainment. If, the, if they decide, okay. Questions? Is that, so we're, we're going to, the applicant will limit entertainment to? Indoors. Indoors. I guess before we do that, I would want to know more about noise and the extent to which the building and the structure would baffle noise so that, in fact, it doesn't exceed the required levels at the property line. It seems to me that that's, that's the framework we're, we're working at. Um, and I, and I, I don't know whether the building itself would provide enough of a baffle so that if it were an acoustic guitar, not the Cape High School jazz band, because that clearly would, well, I would anticipate would go beyond the <laughs> property level based on what I've heard. Um, but, it strikes me that there may be some kind of lower decibel entertainment that could happen on that enclosed patio that would, so, that would not affect the residential neighbors way on the other side of the building. And so I, I just wonder if perhaps we don't go too far by saying no outdoor entertainment. But For instance, uh, someone with a acoustic guitar unamplified singing on the patio for right. a couple hours. Yeah. Uh, perhaps we could... Which, which might not exceed... Any noise? It might. It might not. We well, don't have a, a, a the invited C actually did a decibel. Oh, and, the, and I'm guessing that's going to be beyond the scope of yeah. what they're looking for. Yeah. But one way to do it is either or. Either it's inside, or you provide say, proof that it's. We want that to be enforced. We don't want the neighbors like that sounds a little. You know, mm. we we don't want people running over there constantly having to check. The I agree. It, it, whatever we do, if we decide to do something, should be enforced. Maybe we should ask the applicant. I mean, is, is an indoor only a... a, a well, uh, it's not ideal. Well, I understand. <laughs> is it feasible to have a decibel monitor in place on the patio for outdoor entertainment well, so that if, if someone, well, I, or at the edge of the property line somewhere in place so that, that there is a monitoring that's if you decide to do outdoor entertainment, that there would be in place a decibel monitor at the property boundary somewhere close to the residential boundary so that I'm if not sure how practical that is. I, do, I don't know if that's Do the police have one? From an engineering point of view. Do we know? When, when the planning board granted the approval to the in by the sea, the in by the sea was required to buy a noise meter. Mm -hmm. And I've the town manager really has, has, has instructed the code officer to uh, start pricing one of those out. <laughs> I have no idea what they cost. The in by the sea is re they should have one now. Mm. If they don't, I don't want to know. But See, the, the difference, though, with the in by the sea, and uh, again, we're in a situation where we don't have as much information as we did with the in by the sea. They hold weddings there. They know, I mean, they use mm. the same four bands over and over and over. Right. They, they know exactly the type of music that's going to be played. They know the tents that they use. I mean, if I remember the detail from that, they, they have a lot more information, and the planning board had a lot more information than we do now. Scale I mean, this is an idea. Scale is, scale is it's totally different. massive. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's yeah. drastically but, different. But to address Victoria's concern, you, you could do any... Entertainment. You could you get married, there's going to be... Well, that's what I mean. I mean, this was, this was part of what they, this is part of what Invite right. C did. We don't have that kind of information. Well, and that's why I'm saying that it's a restaurant. 
and I've heard a couple of times tonight it was said, you're coming here for the food, not so much a show, an entertainment. So um, if there is any entertainment indoors. Or, or if you're going to do it outside, then you have to show us it's not exceeding the, the. Well, I'd rather have no outdoors because I'm hearing it from the neighbors. I'm hearing the neighbors saying, we, we want to say, And then it's the BA district. It's supposed to be neighborhood. Mm. No, I'm. I'm <laughs> It's not supposed to be um, anything other than for the neighbors. I mean, if you go back and read what the BA district... You know, I, I agree with you completely. I'm trying to build in the initial approval some flexibility to achieve both goals, which is the neighbors don't want to be bothered by the music. Uh, well, does that mean, though, that, that we don't want any music piped out there? Are we only talking live music, or are we talking... Because they could have speakers with low-level music, and you never hear it at the houses. Outside. Outside. From the music being played inside? From a stereo inside. Or a stereo inside. Yeah. It, yeah. I think that might even go under entertainment. I think if you go back and read, it's, it's, yeah, it's, wonder it's music. So um, it would still have to meet decibels and all that. But yeah. I mean, I, I'm just trying to make it very clear cut. I don't want it to be, that's kind of loud. You know, I don't want the police running out. I don't want the code enforcement running out. I, just very clear cut. And we're talking three months out of the year, so it's not a you know, make or break. It's, and that's three months when the neighbors will have their windows open, and they're also trying oh, to... Oh, I agree with that. I'm just trying to make it clear that the neighbors and for Rudy's. Rudy's is presenting themselves as a restaurant. We're in by the sea. I can see where they had, you know, it was an entertainment spot. Yeah, but restaurants have music. I mean, well, yeah. they do have restaurants where somebody's playing the guitar, or there's classical music in That's the background, true. or jazz. But I don't know how close so. the neighbors are to those restaurants. Yeah. Well, no, but I'm saying we, it, once again, restaurants have inside. music. It's not. I don't think we can draw that line. If the neighborhood was there, it wouldn't be an issue. But they're there, so and they were there. I'm just trying to make it that the neighbors are happy and want to see this go forward. So, given given that, if if if. There was entertainment outside, and the neighbors just never heard it. I'm sorry, outside the entertainment. That wouldn't be an issue for you, then. If they never heard it, yeah, it wouldn't be an issue if they never heard it. I mean, that seems to me to be the standard, is is this going to exceed what it's supposed to? And again, I'm, I'm trying to, inside, the applicant's telling it's just not ideal. So I guess I'm, I'm trying to propose something that maybe, again, satisfies both sides here where the neighbors don't get bothered by it but gives you the option of having something outside if you can show it's not going to disturb the neighbors. Yeah, I, I think that that's, that's a valid option and uh, I mean we're talking about something that, that wouldn't happen until there's an entertainment license issued anyway. Mm -hmm. So maybe it, I guess one of my concerns would be that you know if you, if you make it a planning board condition that Wait. there's no outside entertainment and then Mary goes to get her entertainment license and and we can prove that that the uh, the sound decibels meet the ordinance and are not an issue then we've got to come back and amend the site plan because because yeah, of the condition true. that you've imposed on well that's why I'm suggesting in, mm -hmm. in a war I'm not saying in a blanket you can have music outside I'm saying prove to you know show us so that maybe, the burden would be on you at that point to come back with us with the same level of proof well, would we come back here, or would it be part of the entertainment permit or entertainment license with the council that that we would we would have to kind of um, provide them with with uh, some evidence that we're meeting the ordinance? Are you asking me is that part of the entertainment license application, yes. or that is part of our no. approval? No, I'm asking if it's if it's. I don't know. I don't know either. But um, it seems to me that you're, you're trying to make a condition of approval for site plan something on something that's that's a license that's uh, issued by the council. Uh, it's a separate. It's a separate. It seems to me that we ought to be able, as we did with the end by the sea, to say that there will be no music or other entertainment outside unless the applicant installs noise monitoring equipment at the property line, which, so can, which provides uh, a record, preferably one that you know, would have a little printout or something that somebody could come back and read and say, yeah, you're right, that noise level did not exceed. And so there, there's a clear marker for enforcement. I don't know what kind of technology there is on this kind of noise monitoring equipment. That's, 
We don't have that information in front of us, but I'd be very reluctant to say flat out, no outside music. I agree with that. I, 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 but I do think it's a, the burdens on the applicant to show that they're meeting the standards if that's what they're looking to do outside. I mean, we're also making another assumption that inside music won't exceed the noise. That's true. <laughs> and technically, if they're making noise inside or anywhere on the site, it's not it exceeds, to go it exceeds over the noise standards. The noise standards. And I think it's fair to put the burden on the applicant, applicant to have that kind of equipment available before the entertainment. And I don't think that's anything inconsistent with what the town council would do if they were granting an entertainment license. But the noise issue is, is more. Is, is our, ours. I agree. Are you how, how burdensome is that, though? Do we know? I mean, are we asking for thousands of dollars in I, equipment? I Does anybody know. have any idea? No. I, I never had to buy a noise meter. No. <laughs> I mean, I've got a tuner that, but it doesn't, it measures on pitch and yeah. it's 50 bucks. Yeah, I, I don't think the basic equipment for at the property line, you know, constant monitoring may be burdensome, but you know, if you show to me initially it's, it's meeting it, that should be enough. To I just have this vision of somebody wanting to sit and play guitar during Sunday brunch and not being able to do it because they don't have a noise monitor. But once again, um, Pat did say it's not about entertainment, it's about dining and gathering with neighbors. But the I know Victoria, but people go to restaurants where there is music, whether there are neighbors or not. And there are restaurants here. There's music at the good table when I go in there. I, there's been a jazz guitarist sitting in there. I mean, I, I think it's unfair to say it's a restaurant, therefore we have to put these limitations on it. I understand the neighbors are there, but we're, we've got noise standards in place that are there for a reason. We don't have, I don't think it's our job to, to institute artificially lower noise standards because we have neighbors closer to that restaurant than we may have in another place. That's my concern. Do they play outside in the patio at the, uh, in, at the uh, good table? So I... They've been inside. When it's been the yeah, I don't remember room. hearing any music at the good table. I, mean, I know they have a roof over there outdoor. Oh, they yeah. do? They yeah. do. So I was thinking about that. I just... I certainly have never heard music ever. Come no, I've never heard music out there. I've heard it from, Not outside. I've heard it from In by the Sea. Oh, yeah. Sound blankets or not. Oh, yeah. And I live pretty far away from the United States, but that's a whole, it's, those are bands. Those are bands, bands you yeah. know, whole blown bands. And they're amp, that's true, they're amplified bands. Well, once again, they're trying to meet the decimal levels, too. And then you're, you're making the comment, you can hear it well, with the, your blankets. I, I will say this, it's never bothered me, never no, kept me up. it's never bothered you can hear but it. But on the still night in the summer with my, all the windows open in the house, you can hear the music over yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Just thinking of the neighbors. No, I'm... I am a neighbor of both establishments. Um, my, my inclination in terms of a condition of approval would be to limit it to the inside, or if they want to do it outside, they've got to show affirmatively that they're meeting the noise standards, rather than passively waiting for uh, somebody to complain, and then we go take a measure. I think, that, I think that's a fair compromise. Yeah, who do they show? How do they do that? With the decimal. Well, the, the, well how does the end by the sea do it? Well, the M by the C, <laughs> the M by C hired a, a noise specialist to measure the ambient decibel levels, and then they they had a demonstration band out there, and they cranked it up to a certain number. And the, the standard actually said you could crank it up to a certain number, and you have the noise blankets. And when what they went out, what and they measured it. The, the amplification oh, sure. inside the tent. So they actually they measured it at the side property line, and they measured it at the property line. Um, on Route 77. So they, they did that extra work and then uh, they agreed to buy a noise meter and have it calibrated so if there was ever a complaint, the police department could go down there, take the noise meter and actually measure what was going on. That last part, that's what we wanted to do. I didn't hear that last part. <laughs> that last part. That, that they had a calibrated, calibrated noise, noise meter. meter or so. Calibrated noise meter. That but they don't get out there every time every band no. plays, though, do they? No, they only, they only respond to They did it complaints. once. They did it once. They get a complaint. They, they have the noise meter available, and they can actually measure it. My understanding is they're a little bit um, more direct than that. They say, turn the music down. Mm. <laughs> and if they have to go back a second time, and they say, turn the music off. So what we want is a calibrated noise meter. There is that's what I mean by affirmatively showing. And that's what I mean by overblowing it for a 80-seat 
neighborhood restaurant. I don't just buying that piece of equipment. I think this is not. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. That's my concern. I just don't know. How would you know, know that going over the decimal if you don't measure it? Well, yeah, that's. It, not Other than somebody calling up saying it's awful noisy. Yeah. yeah. Right. How would you know definitely? Could we well, how would, how would, how would any of us know? I mean, we don't know. Have a that's generally how it's done. I'm Googling noise meters right See. now. <laughs> Thirty-two hundred bucks. I'm sorry. You, you step up. I'm happy. Bucks, I'm, happy. I'm, I'm happy to hit, take the input, but you have to step up to the mic. Right. <laughs> we'll talk to you I just, I just, I just, you could just speak the name again. Uh, Scott Urban. Thank you. Go ahead. So, anyways, I, when the noise meter came up earlier. I googled it. Uh, the one I found, thirty-two hundred bucks. Yeah, it's more than I thought of. 3,200. 3,200. For a noise yeah. meter. Yeah. yeah, they're not cheap. But Get all that. Would you know? But if the uh, inn's buying one for the town, I suppose that's not a problem. But well, the inn has, well, the inn has its own. Oh. Yeah. Here I'm looking at. Here's one at Radio Shack for 45. As in 4,500? 45. 4498. Forty-four dollars and ninety-eight cents. Now, what what's the quality? I have no idea. <laughs> so anywhere in between forty-four dollars. Here's another one for two hundred. It's a pretty wide spectrum. Two hundred and fifty bucks, one hundred and fifty you know bucks. That's why I, I, I'm, I'm trying to stay away from anything other than a indoor only or b. You want to put a guitarist out there? You have to show us you're meeting the noise standards. Period. Who are you but, going to show? I mean, not that I object to that, but, but no, what, are they, what are they practically going to um, do? I, yeah. That's why I asked Maureen about how the Inn by the Sea does it, and they, they set it all up ahead of time for the four bands they use right. repeatedly. Mm -hmm. How else would you know if they're over this 65 decimal? I don't, I, I, how else would you know? I don't know. I'm trying to open it up to, other than to mm. put a I mean, pan on the outside because I think a, you know. in the right circumstances it could be very nice to be there on the outside with somebody playing modest. I know, but you've got to have an enforceable yeah. rod, so how no, do I, you know? Victoria, I agree with you, the issue. I just, I'm trying to uh, not just close the door completely. I mean, it, we can go that route. I'm just hesitant to do that. We can go that route, and then if they want outside entertainment, they could come back with an amendment on that one issue. You know, and I'm not encouraging, I'm not trying to, to um, run up the expense for the applicant unnecessarily, but maybe that's a compromise we have, because there will be another issue that plays out, and that's at the time the entertainment license is applied for. I'm sure this same discussion will come up again sure appropriately. Yeah. Um, so maybe at that point it will get solved. It's just now you've, they've got a site plan in place that they will also have to go fix right. if they... Uh, address the concerns that you've raised in in the entertainment license with with the, uh, the town at the town council level. I'm trying to avoid that second step if possible. If it's not, maybe they if they want to do outside entertainment. I think the applicant wants to say something. Hi, I'm Mary Page. I own Rudy's of the Cape, 517 Ocean House Road. I am not going through all of this with the town to make a problem with a noise level. Mm. We're talking an acoustic guitar, maybe, maybe. Jazz band, maybe, little. Nothing that it would be more of a radio. Um, maybe the sound of 77 would drown it out. This, we're not talking amplified. We're talking very, very minimal, very low key. Nothing that I wouldn't like. Nothing that any of you would like, no. Just a nice place to come and enjoy. That's it. Thanks. Is, is a no amplification outside helpful? Speakers coming from inside to outside is amplification. Yep. I meant the music. If the music's outside and unamplified, are we comfortable enough that that's not going to get too loud? I think we're making this much more complicated I than agree. it needs to be. Yeah. <laughs> I actually was hoping that it was really simple by just saying no music, no entertainment outside. I'm not willing to do that. Yeah, I guess I'm, I'm reluctant to do that too. I mean, I'm, yeah, I am too. that's not something I'm interested in voting on, affirmatively for, and that's three. 
So, I mean, we could we can limiting the hours. Is that anything? Because they did that with the emergency. Well, that to me is governed by the BA, and that was the subject. My my view is is um, those those issues were already hashed out at the time the BA district was both hashed out at our level and, and at the town council level. But to pull back on that to me is is sort of going against what we've already been given as guidance in the BA district regulations. Although limiting music outside to specific, to specific hours might not be. So I don't think that was really allow the outdoor patio to stay sure. open, but no yeah, outdoor music that. after. That was misunderstood. I'm oh, sorry. sorry. I'm, the entertainment. I, um, I, miss, I did misunderstand what you're saying. I wasn't clear. Is that something the board would be willing to address? Mm -hmm. In by the sea stops by eight at night. You mean the out, you're talking entertainment. Out, outside? Oh, any entertainment. Entertainment. Yeah, I'm not willing to limit it to eight in, yeah, in this case either. It's a different kind of place. Yeah. It's part of the noise ordinance. Do they have to prove they make? They they meet a certain level. I don't still have the. In any at any yeah, yeah at any. So yeah. when they any activity. So yeah. when they yeah, apply for the license then. Yeah, jackhammer. But the right. noise ordinance doesn't put an affirmative burden on the producer of the noise right. to establish that they have met the standard before they allowed to meet it. Basically, the noise ordinance says you can't exceed this standard, and so they say, okay, town, come prove to me that I am exceeding it. Hmm. And I think that's where we have an issue here. Yeah, I don't want the burden on the town. So we, is, is there some reasonable way to make sure that there's a way to establish? I mean, at this point, we can't because the building, the structure isn't even there. I'm sorry, I don't understand what you mean by that. Well, if we had an existing, like the Inn by the Sea has a tent. They can go into the tent. They can do a study in the tent and right. figure out what's going to happen. There's no building. There's, there's no way to do that there's now until, until it, the building is constructed. And I, I, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. We could require a noise study to be done after the construction is complete. Just, uh, that's, I'm not that's a lot of money. Yeah. That's a lot of money. I'm that's not, I'm not inclined to go down that road. I'm not inclined to vote affirmatively for a restriction on inside only either. But you know, maybe what we need to do is put out a motion and then see who wants to amend it, then take the votes, and if, then move on. I mean, it's there are five of us, so it's, yeah, <laughs> difficult to parse out these issues one at a time. Uh, but I think there are some conditions that we can uh, handle one at a time. Maybe we should try it that way. Well, let me before before I present the motion, let me just tell you that uh, how I have amended what we started out with. Sure. Okay. I have accepted out of the town engineer's letter, the second paragraph of number seven. Okay. Um, have added a condition that the applicant execute an agreement with St. Bart's uh, for the use of no fewer than 15 spaces for overflow parking. I've added a condition that the applicant, or stating that the applicant has agreed to install a crosswalk um, once the appropriate approvals have been granted. And I have added a condition that the applicant will install signage to delineate the, and I've got them listed, the various spaces that have to be delineated. Compact car, full width of handicapped spaces, loading and service areas, and the no parking areas adjacent to the handicapped and compact spaces. That's what I have. Mm -hmm. Have I missed anything? I don't think so, but I was writing as people were talking, so. We're not changing any landscaping, we're not changing any lighting, as I understand it. Right, that's done. Shall we give it a, a try? <coughs> uh, I want to try to figure a way to fairly put Victoria's issue on the table and take a vote on it. Because, uh, oh, I thought you wanted to do this and then amend. No? Whatever. It doesn't matter to me. Well, I'm trying to think procedurally. If we put this motion out there, we go through the whole thing and we approve it, that's the end of the issue. I'm, trying to, I'm what, looking for procedural way. The procedural, the procedural way that you could vote on this would be for Beth to offer a motion, mm -hmm. for someone to second it, 
for someone else to offer an amendment to the motion. <laughs> and separately vote on that. And for that amendment to be seconded, then you vote on the amendment and then first. And then you decide whether or not that's going to be added to the motion. And then whether or not that fails, you then can vote on the main motion. That's a great idea. Okay. Why don't you propose your motion? All right. I have a motion for the board to consider. All right. Hold on to your seats. Uh, <laughs> findings of fact. One. Two Lights General Store LLC is proposing a change of use of Rudy's of the Cape located at 517 Ocean House Road to an 80-seat restaurant which requires site plan review under Section 19-9 site plan regulations. Two, the town engineer has recommended revisions to the plans. Three, the application substantially complies with Section 19-9 site plan review. Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Two Lights General Store LLC for site plan review of Rudy's on the Cape, an 80-seat restaurant located at 517 Ocean House Road, be approved subject to the following conditions. One, that the plans be revised per the town engineer's letter dated March 8, 2010, with the exception of the second paragraph of number seven of the town engineer's letter. I've got this written down. I can give this to you. Thank you. Uh, number two, that the lighting in at the front of the building be adjusted to reduce lighting levels at the property line to point to 0.5 foot candles or less. Can we hold on to that now, for a second now. I'll take. Does that need to come out? Yeah, it has. I don't think you would because, it because the new plan right. is done. Okay, that is not number two. Number two is. That's why I, I knew there was okay. a reason why I had a big question mark next to You're doing fine. All right, number two, that there be no alteration of the site as part of this approval or issuance of a building permit until a performance guarantee has been provided by the applicant in an amount acceptable to the town engineer, form acceptable to the town attorney, and all acceptable to the town manager. Three, that the applicant execute an agreement with St. Bartholomew's Church for the use of no fewer than 15 parking spaces for overflow parking. Four, the applicant has agreed to install a crosswalk once the appropriate approvals are granted. And five, the applicant will install signage to delineate the required compact car spaces, full width of the handicapped space, loading and service areas, and the no parking areas adjacent to the handicapped and compact parking spaces. A second it. That's what I got. Okay. Can I propose an amendment? Is that how I do it? Yep. Um, give it a shot here. Um, you can write. Take note. That no amplified outdoor. That no live amplified music be permitted outdoors unless the applicant maintains monitoring equipment to determine to um, maintains equipment to monitor the um, decibel to uh, calibrate the noise level at the perimeter at the residential perimeter of the property you get that, more or less? No. <laughs> do you have it written? No. Okay. That's why it's I think I do. Yeah. Oh, good. Okay. It's even, can you read it back? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> that no live amplified music be permitted outdoors unless the applicant maintains equipment to calibrate noise level at the residential limit of the property. Is that it? That's it. That's an amendment to the proposed That would be an amendment to what? the proposed motion. You all set with it, Elaine? I'm done. Do we have a second, a second on the proposed amendment? I would second it. You don't have to. <laughs> 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 um, 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 uh, the amendment having been uh, proposed by uh, Elaine and uh, seconded by Victoria, do we have any discussion on the amendment? And I, I think that's too complex and, and, and intrusion right now, and I'm going to be voting no against it, but for the reasons I stated before, I think it potentially causes more problems, and, um, and that's why I'm going to be voting no. Anyone else wish to make any comments on, the, on that proposed amendment? 
before we I take concur a vote. with your thoughts. I do as well. All, right. all in favor of the amendment to the motion, raise your hand. All opposed in the amendment to the motion. A motion to amend the motion on the floor fails. We have a pending motion on the floor with an appropriate second. I think it was made by Beth Richardson. I forgot who seconded it for the record. Jim, Jim, Jim Hubner. Uh, for the approvals, for the approval with the conditions uh, stated, do we have any discussions on the motion on the floor to approve the plan? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion? All those opposed? None. The approval carries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Could I move that we adjourn? <laughs> Make a motion. Any seconds? Motion. Uh, <laughs> all in favor of the motion to adjourn? We're off to